All right, hello, welcome back. As you see from the title, we're going to learn about God's love for His creation. So, we all grew up in life, regardless of your age, whether you're 5, 30, 50, or 90, all of us have heard, no matter what religion you're in, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, regardless of your religion, we all have heard the thing bang over our head time and time again God or God's love his or their creation specifically I'm coming from a biblical point of view I don't like to call myself a Christian because it's so it's been so maligned I like to call myself a follower of the way if you read the book of Acts those early individuals didn't use the term Christian. Now in Christ, he did use the word church when he was talking to Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. But the word Christian came about rather either decades or centuries later. In the beginning, they just said we are followers of the way. So that's how I define myself. So let's read this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Uh oh, we got to stop right there. It's saying your kingdom come. So God's kingdom is not on earth yet. God does not rule supreme on earth yet. God's will is not being done on earth. And we're going to learn that as we go on further. Here we go. Thou will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is right there. God's complete will is not done on earth like it's in heaven. So when a disaster happened, when a tsunami Tornado, tornado, hurricane, typhoon, monsoon, etc., etc. Don't turn around and blame God and say, God has done this to us. Because it said, Thou will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not His overall will. Now, He may give the weather permission to do it. He did do that in the Bible. He let the permission be done. Or if He needs to send a message, like he did to Sodom and Gomorrah and to Egypt and to many other nations. He will use natural disaster to punish sin that reaches all the way up to his throne. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trust up against us. And lead us not into temptation. Like I said earlier. God does not do the evil, but he may allow it to happen. He may allow you to be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As long as we exist in a world where God's will not supreme, evil will be present. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen and that prayer came from God's son alleged son I know some of you all say he's not his son so I'll say to me his son but to others it may be his alleged son from his mouth not from Peter's mouth not from Paul's mouth not from Luke's mouth but from Jesus Christ's mouth this is prayer now we're going to be Matthew 4, 9. This is Satan speaking to Jesus. This is what Satan said. All this I will give you. Okay. That lets you know right there. To give it to someone, you have to own it. For me to give you a new cell phone, I have to already be in possession of the cell phone. For someone to give you a new house, they have to be in possession of that house. For one nation to give another nation billions of dollars 
they must possess the funds first. So Satan said, all this I will give you. So that means he owns it all. Whatever he showed Jesus, he owns it. He's showing them things on earth. So he owns the earth. Since Adam and Eve fell, there was the original inheritance of the earth to rule it. Because God said, rule the earth. Breed and multiply and subdue it. So it wasn't going to be easy. They had to subdue it. But God said, you are the rulers of this planet. Until they fell and ate whatever that thing was that God said not to eat. As soon as they did that, the ownership, the rulership transferred to Satan, his demons, and his henchmen. Let me read it again. Matthew 4 now. All this I will give you. He said, if you will bow down and worship me. That tell you a lot right there. Satan does not hate God. Satan is not God's enemy. Satan just want to be God. He want to be like God. So keep that in mind. Satan don't hate God. When he was talking to Jesus, he never said, I hate you. He just want to be God. He want to get the love that God had directed towards him. All right, so we got that from this. God is, not, God is a God of love. He's not responsible for the vast evil that happened to this planet. He will allow it to happen to send a message. But he don't think up, let me send this disaster that's to kill these people. It's for a reason. Let's move forward. This is Genesis 30, chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. That's huge right there. He did not say it's excellent. He did not say it's perfect. Or he said it was good. When you was in school, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, a good grade is like a B. A good grade is an 80 85 and the 80 range a excellent perfect grade is 90 and above God said it's good so there can be genetic abnormalities in society there can be earthquakes here there can be tornadoes because it's still good he didn't say it's perfect he said it's good one person can be a dwarf another person can be a giant but overall he said the per pervert creation is good one person may have cancer one person may have a healthy body. Because remember, he said it's good. He didn't say it's perfect. Perfect means there are no diseases. There's no dwarfism. There's no genetic abnormalities. A good creation means all in all, everything is running well. It's good. There can be some outliers. There can be some grades near 10. And the bulk of them between 50. Uh, let me see, seven, in the 70 range. There can be grades near 95. Those are the outliers from 10 to 90. But the bulk of the grades are in the middle 70 range. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So remember this, my good people. The earth is not a perfect world. It's a good world. Creation is not perfect. It's good. There can be slight errors in it, slight errors abnormalities this is Genesis chapter 18 verse 13 to 15 then the Lord said to Abraham why did Sarah laugh and say will I really have a child now that I am old is anything too hard for the Lord I will return to you at the point of time next year not five years not ten years he said I'm coming back next year and Sarah will have a son Sarah was afraid, so she lied and oh, see, here you go, people in the Bible lie. So she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did. The point here is, my good people, you see how much God loves Sarah? And this goes into my other point. Creation is good, but sometimes a woman cannot have a child. Abraham can have a child because before he had Isaac, he had Ishmael. So Abraham can rest easy at night and say, I'm not at fault. I know I can produce these children. The fault is Sarah. Her womb is barren. But God loves Sarah and Abraham so much. He said, look, I know your womb is barren, barren but I'm going to come down there and give you a child because for me, nothing is too hard. I love you so much, Sarah. I love you so much, Abraham. 
You all been praying to me for all these decades. Over and over, night after night, crying and weeping for at least one child. And you know, my good people, when you haven't had a child in a decade or so, your one child take the place of five or six children. You're so happy to have that one child, you singing and leaping for joy. And that's how Sarah was. And Abraham a little bit, but you know, Abraham, he did have a son, so he said, okay, let's produce another son. But Sarah, she was the one who poured all her love into her son because God loved her so much that he showed her a miracle and gave her a baby when she was, quote, old. Remember back in Abraham time, my good people, they could have lived to be 200 years old or more, 200, 250. So when God said Ab Sarah and Abraham was old, we don't know how old they are. They could have been 150 years old. They could have been 80, but still walking around healthy as a 40-year-old. They could have been 80 or 90, but still had the vitality of a 60-year-old. Because aging back then was different than the way we age now. But the point is, God loved Sarah and Abraham so much, he heard their prayer, and he was going to give them a son. And he said, look, it's not going to be a surprise either. When you had this son... You're not going to say, oh, we finally got one. No, you're going to say, we got this, son, because God loved us so much. He gave us a warning. He told us a year ago what's going to happen next year. Next year, we got that baby coming. This is from Genesis chapter 18, verse 24 to 26. What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all, not some of earth, not a little bit of earth, will not the judge of all earth do right. The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. We all heard about the city of, uh, the terror of Sodom and Gomorrah, but the main thing is here, how much God is a God of love. He has vast abilities beyond human comprehension. And he has said that many times in the Bible. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. But the point is. He loved his creature so much. That he would listen to Abraham. He actually loved his creature so much. That Abraham said something to him. And he did not get mad and irate like most humans would. When somebody trying to correct them. He loved so much, he listened. Then he said, look, if there's 50 people there, Abraham, I'm going to spare the city because that's how much you love them. I love you and you love them, so I'm going to extend my love to them. Then Abraham kept saying, if it's 40, would you kill it for the 40? God said, no, Abraham, I won't. You have mercy on them, so I'm going to have mercy on you. Your, the mercy I show from you, I'm going to extend it to them. Then he said, 30. Then he said 20. Then he said 10. And I believe he said he got down to 5. Then God said, okay, okay, that's enough. That's enough. If I can't find 5 people here, they deserve to be wiped off the face of the planet. But the point is, my good people, how much God loved his creatures that he kept reducing it each time that Abraham acts. That's love. That's mercy. God loved so much that he listened to his creature, Abraham. He loved so much he was going to spare that city at 50, at 40, at 30, if 10 righteous people was there, and even at 5, he was going to spare that city. That's love, people. That's love. This is Numbers 22, verse 28. Then the Lord opened the mouth, then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and they said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Looking at my good people. You see how much God loved his creatures? A while ago, I was talking about his love for Abraham. Now, he's showing his love for his lowly animals. He's showing his love for his donkey. That he let the donkey speak and say, Why are you abusing me? And if you ever read the story of um, Balaam, the donkey was actually protecting him because those three prior times, it was an angel waiting in the middle of the road with a sword and it was ready to strike Balaam 
dead. But to save its owner, the donkey loved its owner so much that every time it saw the angel, it would rear, rear, veer away from the road. It veered away from the road the last time where I believe the donkey tried to veer away and he got caught in a tunnel. And if you know a tunnel, it got that wall. It was the donkey was pushed up against the wall and it was making his Balaam's feet crush up against the wall. And so Balaam got angry, so angry, he took out his whip and beat the donkey. And God showed his love for his donkey to make his donkey speak because the donkey was trying to save the owner's life because it loved his owner. So we're gonna assume prior to this, Balaam probably was treating his donkey nice and kind like we do in life. But when somebody makes us angry, that's when we lose it. We want to retaliate. But you see, in conclusion, he loved his animal so much that he gave it the ability to express itself. John chapter 4, verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew or Israelite, as I like to say, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I'm going to stop right there and say, the Jewish people, or the Israelites, and Samaritans, they had like a blood feud. You have a blood feud, you don't want to have nothing to do with the other party. They had a beef. You have a beef with another clan, another clique, you don't want to have nothing to do with them. So the Samaritans and, and the Israelites, the Jews, was on those type of terms. They did not associate with each other in any way. But here we see Jesus, he showing his so, his so much kindness and love for this woman that he took it upon himself to speak to the lady. The, not just to ask for water. If you read more verse chapter 4, he's actually getting into a lengthy conversation with her. That's love. He took a time to talk to this woman in a lengthy conversation about the kingdom of God when both it, when the Israelites and the Samaritan was shooting with each other. They didn't want to have nothing to do with each other. But Christ, Jesus, showed his love for her by talking to her. What more can you say? This is showing how much God loves. And you know in the Bible, Jesus, he did admit that he was God's son, and he admitted that he was equal with God. He did not hold back, but he took the time to speak to this enemy of his people. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 to 13. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. So you understand that? We do not see all of God. We only see a reflection of God. We only see a shadow. Like when Moses asked to see God's image, God said, look, if you see me completely, you will die. You'll get slaughtered. I'm just going to let you see my backside. You can't look at my face. No human can see my face and live. Whether I want you to live or not, your body cannot take my glory and my brilliance. Then we shall see face to face. When we're going to get God face to face, we'll be in our resurrection body, which can withstand the heavenly realm. Now, I know in part, I know a little bit now, no matter how much we think we know of God, we know a little. I've been reading the Bible for 30 or close to 40 years, but every time I read that book, I learn something new. So I only see in part. Then I shall know fully when I'm resurrected and I'm standing in the kingdom of God, I will know everything I need to know about God. I will know him fully. Even as I'm known fully, he and all the angels will know me fully. Now these three remain faith, which keep us going every day. I have faith for a brighter day, a great faith for a brighter future. Hope. I hope I will survive the next day. I hope God will meet my needs. And love. Who do I have to cherish me? Who can I show love and affection for? But the greatest of these is love. God, he has faith in human beings. He has hope that we're going to do better. 
and he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. That's how much God loved us. And this is the last concluding part, my good people. As the title said in this picture, forgive them, Father. Let, so let me read Luke 23, 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they, the Gentiles, divide up his clothes by casting lots or playing dice. Here we see this man, he's dying on a cross in agony. Most of us, the vast amount of humans, when we die on, a, on anything in agony, we're yelling, cursing out, or we're crying to save us. We're cursing our enemies, one. We're crying, two, because of the pain, or three, we're begging for our life. Rarely will someone ever say, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And that's what Jesus said, my good people. Forgive them. So that's it, my good people. If you like my content of this topic about God's love, please give me a thumbs up. If you had any additional information to enlighten me on the power of love and God's power of love, please leave a comment. If you are able, and I would like for you to do this, if you enjoy this video or this discussion, please share this on Facebook, share it on Twitter, share it on Instagram, or share it on the competitor of YouTube. I forgot the name, I haven't been there. But share this content on social media, please. You all have a wonderful day. Keep reading your Bible. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us learn more and more about how you love all your creation. You just don't love human beings. You love the earth. You love the animals. You love the sun. You love the other stars. You love the planets. You love the asteroids. Everything that you made, Lord, you love it. When you made the earth, you didn't, when you made creation, you did not say it's perfect. You said it's good. Thank you for the love and the kindness you have shown us. Thank you in the name of your, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.